So I don't know how many people remember last summer in Monterey, the Vacas that came in. Um, there were seven sailing vessels that were constructed, and they started all over the Pacific, all around Polynesia, and they sailed to a great convergence event in Hawaii in the midsummer, and then they sailed on to the Pacific coast, um, and then they sailed on to into Southern California, and the intent is to continue to sail over vast parts of the Pacific. For thousands of years, this culture uh, went fearlessly uh, to the ocean, and some of them came back. Uh, to tell their stories, and maybe some of them didn't. Hawaii has been a key example of the relationship historically between humans and their environment. Um, the Apapuaha system really linked the people in the watersheds to the ocean resources, and it was considered all one system. In fact, even the rocks and trees were spiritual bodies along with the people. So we have a long history of closely coupled systems um, a lot of that changed more recently, um, and some of that is from more of a European uh, perspective, when if you remember the early nautical charts, people didn't really know where the world ended. There was some concern that you could sail right off the edge of the flat world and fall into oblivion. Um, there was a fear of going into the ocean. And I have to admit, as a kid, I was pretty fearful the first gallon or so of seawater I swallowed in the Pacific. As a marine ecologist and professor, when I take students out into the rocky intertidal, I always tell them at Point Lobos, you have to be very careful. There can be rogue waves. Anytime, you have to really keep an eye on things because you could be washed away off the rocks. And so remember, uh, if you see a wave coming, hunker down like a limpet, you know, hold on uh, to the rocks. Uh, on the last field trip I did, the only person who got hit by a wave on the trip was, and I was hugged, hugged down like a limpet, but I was covering my 35 millimeter camera. So. As a child growing up, I, ha I really had a personal experience with this because I grew up in, in Fresno, Fresno, and if you remember Wolfman Jack, it's 10,000 degrees in Fresno, and so I liked swimming. And my dad came home after work, and he came to the community, he never swam. And for years and years, I said, Dad, you know, do you know how to swim? Yeah, it's hot. Why didn't you get in the water? And, and after years and years, he told me the story of being in the U.S. Navy in World War II. He was a mechanics mate. He drove LSTs onto beaches during invasions. LSTs, uh, the Navy, Navy people will tell you, means large, slow target. Um, so he was at several large, slow targets shot out off Italy. Um, off uh, various Pacific islands. And for days one time, he was in the water with a life jacket until the battle ended, and then he was picked up. So his fondness for swimming was small, okay? And so you need to have the understanding of how humans relate to oceans. And one of the things that humans have done is commodify oceans. In other words, we use things in the ocean for things that benefit us economically. We wouldn't refer to fish stocks if we didn't think of them as something that was a commodity. We wouldn't refer to fish in tons if we thought of them as individual fish. We wouldn't call something like the local sardine a forage fish. It doesn't think of itself as just being food, okay? Uh, but we give it a name. As people have interacted with the ocean, it's often been uh, for personal gain, for enjoyment, whatever. And you can see that there are a wide variety of uses of the ocean. Um, that variety is increasing. Uh, with uh, LNG facilities and wind and tidal and aquaculture and so on. So the question is, what's the future of our relationship with the ocean? Um, we know in the historical past in a lot of island nations, people had very close relationships with the ocean and dependent relationships. But frankly, we've separated ourselves from the ocean. We're alienated from the ocean. A lot of even scientists view people as just being some kind of enemy of the ocean, right? They take too much out, they put too much in, um, and so people are external to the ocean. And what scientists like me are trying to overcome now is the notion that we're not external, we're integral to ocean ecosystems. And one of my graduate students, Jana Shakarov, uh, wrote a chapter with me where she made this case. You know what? There's a lot of richness and complexity to the relationship of people to the oceans, but we mustn't think of people as external to the oceans, but fully integrated into these ocean ecosystems. And so people have looked at various ways of thinking about history, from log books, from whalers, uh, to works of art and so on, thinking about how people related to the ocean. And a lot of the history written, at least in Western thought, is about 
people using the ocean resources for some purpose that benefited us. I want to tell you two short case studies that I find really interesting. Jana's dissertation project was on the Kona coast of Hawaii. She was interested in historical ecology, like what was this system like 30 years ago, 50 years ago, 100 years ago? The first scientific study was 20 years ago. So how do you find out about what this coast was like uh, way back in the past? And what you do is you talk to the ocean experts. And the ocean experts weren't just native Hawaiians, uh, but also researchers, aquarium collectors, and so on. In fact, she talked to 600 ocean science experts about this coastline that were identified by their peers. And what was interesting is they went back 100 years and they agreed almost precisely on the story of change on the Kona coast. They identified with different organisms in different parts of the system. For some people, parts of the system were pretty colorful fish that scientists like to study and the aquarium collectors like to collect. But for other people, parts of the system were pretty homely little gray fish that are yummy to eat, or algae that are harvested from the inner tidal. But their views of the system and change over time, what happened to the yellow tang, what happened to sea turtles, is a pretty consistent story. Um, and, and I want to tell a yellow tang story, which is really interesting. Most people don't know this, but the Kona Coast is the gold coast of the big island of Hawaii. Is it the gold coast because of the great gold rush in Hawaii? No, it's the gold coast because there were so many brightly colored yellow fish in the water that when ships came in, the water glowed yellow. When they built the airport, when planes flew in, you could see the yellow from the air. Yellow tang is simply a key species, but you see how yellow tang are valued so differently by different people, um, like for tourism, a scientist like to study pretty colorful fish. For promoting your ecotourism opportunity, there's the yellow tang flag. And then the bottom right corner are some yellow tang that didn't make it successfully through the aquarium collection process. And so yellow tang are resonant with a whole bunch of different groups. I want to shift a little bit of story to talk about sea turtles. You know I couldn't do go without sea turtles. Um, I studied bycatch of sea turtles in the international longline fishery especially in the North Pacific. And we went to great lengths to estimate how many longline hooks are there out there, how many turtles do they capture, what impact does that have on the population. And we made estimates for the entire globe. And I was quite proud of this work. It was very difficult to do. And my friend Hoyt Peckham was working in Baja, California with some fishermen uh, down on the Pacific coast of Baja. And you see this bright spot on the left panel here. That's where all the turtles hang out. That's the turtle hotspot. It turns out that fishermen from two fishing villages, uh, Santa Rosa and Puerto Lopez Mateos, killed as many loggerhead sea turtles as the entire international longline fleet. So you might say, those terrible Mexican fishermen, what are they doing killing the turtles? But what was interesting was, when he talked to them, he said, you know, these turtles are critically endangered, and they said, you must be local, because I catch 30 in a set. And what happens is oceanographically, there's a feature there, there's an upwelling there that concentrates the tunas and the turtles and everything else, and it creates high bycatch rates. And so what Hoyt has done is work with people in the local community to modify their fishing practices to reduce bycatch of these loggerheads. This is El Jefe from the Santa Rosa community who agreed on behalf of his community to retire the longline hooks that they used, saving 700 loggerheads a year in one small village in Mexico, and he's also, Hoyt is on the right there, is working with fishermen to modify their practices so they catch just as many fish, they make just as much money, but they do it in a way that reduces their bycatch of sea turtles to really close to zero. This was about a 10-year relationship. In fact, Jay Nichols, who talked earlier this morning, talked about this community and their relationships, and Hoyt uh, just finished his PhD at UC Santa Cruz, building out those kinds of examples. So what I'm calling for us to consider is that we have broken our relationship with the ocean by thinking of humans as separate from oceans. And there's been a lot of conflict between people who use oceans and people who worry about environmental conditions in oceans. In order to move forward, if people cause most of the harm, we have to think about the fact that only people are going to make things better. And so I'm calling you to think about reconciliation as our future. Thank you.